National Public Radio, in association with independent radio drama productions, presents one of the cases of Sherlock Holmes, with Edward Petherbridge as Sherlock Holmes and David Peart as Dr. John H. Watson. I shouldn't complain. Patients are the lifeblood of the medical profession. Oh, James. <laughs> well, Mary, my love, I must retire to bed. Oh, who can it be at this hour? A patient. You'll have to go out. Oh. Will someone see to the door? I must see Mrs. Watson. Well, I'm not... I insist. You will excuse my calling so late. <laughs> I'm in such trouble. I do so want a little help. Why? Oh, it's Kate Whitney. How oh, you startled me, Kate. I had no idea who you were when you came in. I didn't know what to do, so I came straight to you. Oh, it was very sweet of you to come. Now, you must have some wine and water and sit here comfortably and tell us about it. Or should you rather that I sent James off to bed? Oh, no. No. I want the doctor's advice and help, too. It's about Isa. He's not been home for two days. I'm so frightened about him. <gasps> Come along. I'm sure he'll return. I so wick me. Poor oh, woman to have such a oh, husband. Have a, a man wholly addicted to I opium. Sure. I remember the last time I oh. saw him. Yellow, pasty face, oh. drooping lids and pinpoint pupils. Huddled in a chair. The wreck and ruin of a noble man. James... James. Yes, uh, yes, my love. We must help find I, sir. Yes, yes, of course. Uh, now, Kate, uh, have you any idea where he might be? Has he uh, fallen prey to his old habit? I fear he has. He's been gone for almost two days. I have prayed and begged for his deliverance, but he cannot shake off the spell. In recent months, he's confined his... his indulgence to a day and has come back in the evening. He says little and sits in his chair, pale and twitching. But this time, he has not returned. Oh, Mary, what am I to do? Oh, Kate. Kate, we will find him. Where does he go to find him? I, I am almost sure he's gone to the Bar of Gold in Upper Swandham Lane. It's... it's an opium den on the farthest east of the city. I would have gone myself, but I fear to... My dear girl, there's no question of you going to such a place. I will go now, and if he's there, I will bring him back within two hours. Now, don't distress yourself any further. Well, so much for my armchair and cheery sitting room. Still... She is a friend of my wife's, and I am Isa Whitney's medical advisor. <laughs> so let's hope he takes my advice. Lord knows what the cabman thinks of me, charging off to Swandham Lane at the dead of night. <laughs> oh, what a vile place this is. Dark, unwholesome, high warehouses punctured by sightless windows. <sighs> the smell of poverty and disease. That London should have such places. It is a disgrace. Ah, this must be it. Between a slop shop and a gin shop. Cabby, stop here. Right, Roger. Uh, Cabby, I want you to wait here. Very good, sir. Uh, if you're looking for the bar of gold, sir, it's just down there. What? Oh, uh, yes, uh, thank you. Oh, Lord, I can't see a thing. Just a flight of uneven steps leading down to a black hole, like the mouth of a cave. <sighs> well, down we go. Abandon hope, all ye who enter here. Oh, 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 must be careful. These steps are worn. 
No doubt by the ceaseless tread of drunken feet. Ah, there's an oil lamp. That must be the door. Well, I'll just open the latch. Ah, the stench of opium. How can I find Isa here? The room seems to go on forever, like a tunnel. He must be here, somewhere, in one of these wooden berths stacked to the ceiling. But I can barely see through this choking brown opium smoke. Each berth has its own body, like some grub. Inert, bowed shoulders, bent knees, dark dead eyes, each one lit by a red circle of light, now bright, now faint. Opium, the burning poison waxing and waning in their pipes. Oh, God, I must find Isa and get out of this place. No point asking any of this lot. Perhaps that old man sitting by the brazier at the far end... There's a little more light there, at any rate. Would the gentleman care for a pipe? Very best quantity. Eh? Uh, No, no, I I don't want a pipe. Thank you. Uh, I have not come to stay. I believe there's a friend of mine here, uh, Mr. Iso Whitney, uh, and I wish to speak with him. Iso Whitney? Watson? Is that you, Watson? Iso? Thank goodness. Uh, Are you all right? tell, Tell me, Watson... What o'clock is it? Nearly eleven. Uh, of, of what day? Friday, June nineteenth. Oh, oh, good heavens! I thought it was Wednesday. It, it is Wednesday. What do you want to frighten a chap for? I tell you, it is Friday, man. Your wife has been waiting these two days for you. You should be ashamed of yourself. So I am. But you've got it mixed, Watson. For I have only been here for a few hours. Three pipes. Four pipes. I forget how many. But I will go home with you. Uh, I wouldn't frighten Kate. Poor little Kate. Give me your hand. Have you a cab? Yes, I, I have one waiting. Then I shall go in it. Oh, but I, I must owe something. Find out what I owe, Watson. I am all of color. I can do nothing for myself. Right. Up you get. Mind the brazier. There we go. Walk past me and then look back at me. What? Someone spoke. I'm sure of it. Could it have been that old man sitting by the brazier? (laughs) No, surely not. He's drowned in opium. Such an old man. So thin and bent with age. How long has he been there? (laughs) Pipe dangling down between his knees. It could not have been him. (gasps) Holmes! Holmes, what on earth are you doing in this den? As low as you can. I have excellent ears. If you would get rid of that sottish friend of yours, I should be exceedingly glad to have a little talk with you. Uh, I have a cab outside. Then pray send him home in it. You may safely trust him, for he appears to be too limp to get into any mischief. I should recommend you also to send a note by the cabman to your wife to say that you've thrown in your lot with me. If you'll wait outside, I shall be with you in five minutes. Very well, Holmes. What a disguise. Incredible. 
Right. Let's get you home, my son. And then, an adventure. This way. Pleased to have him back. Now, where is Holmes? Ah, there is the decrepit and ancient Holmes shuffling towards me. I'll just go round this corner. Then all should be safe for him. I suppose, Watson, that you imagine that I have added opium smoking to cocaine injection and all the other little weaknesses on which you have favoured me with your medical views. I was certainly surprised to find you there. But not more so than I to find you there. I came to find a friend. And I to find an enemy. An enemy? Yes. One of my natural enemies, or shall I say my natural prey. Briefly, Watson, I'm in the midst of a very remarkable inquiry. And I hope to find a clue in the incoherent ramblings of these sots, as I have done before now. Had I been recognized in that den, my life would not have been worth an hour's purchase. There is a trap door at the back of that building, near the corner of Paul's Wharf, which could tell some strange tales of what has passed through it upon the moonless nights. What? You do not mean bodies. Aye. Bodies, Watson. We should be rich men if we had one thousand pounds for every poor devil who has been done to death in that den. It is the vilest murder trap on the whole riverside, and I fear Neville St. Clair has walked into it, never to walk out of it more. But our dog cart should be here. Now, if I can be of use. Oh, a trusty comrade is always of use. And a chronicler? Still more. My room at the Cedars is a double-bedded one. The Cedars? Yes. That is Mr. Sinclair's house. I am staying there while I conduct the inquiry. Where is it, then? Near Lee in Kent. We have a seven-mile drive ahead of us. <sighs> but I am all in the dark. Of course you are. You'll know all about it presently. Jump up here. All right, John. We shall not need you. Here's half a crown. Look out for me tomorrow about 11. Very good, sir. So long, then. Come on, boy. What is all this about? Holmes is wrapped up in his thoughts and has given nothing away. Good Lord, it's cold on this cart. I think I could be asleep in a warm bed with the woman I love. I must be mad. You have a grand gift of silence, Watson. It makes you quite invaluable as a companion. On my word, it is a great thing for me to have someone to talk to. My own thoughts are not ever pleasant. I was wondering what I should say to this dear little woman tonight when she meets me at the door. You will forget that I know nothing about it. I shall tell you the facts of the case before we get to Lee. It seems absurdly simple, and yet somehow I can get nothing to go upon. Now, I'll state the case clearly and concisely to you, Watson. And maybe you can see a spark where all is dark to me. Oh, proceed, then. Some years ago, to be definite, in May 1884, there came to Lee a gentleman, Neville St. Clair, by name, who appeared to have plenty of money. He took a large villa and lived generally in good style. By degrees, he made friends, and in 1887, he married the daughter of a local brewer, by whom he now has two children. He had no occupation, but was interested in several companies, and went into town, as a rule, in the morning, returning by the 514 from Cannon Street every night. Mr. Sinclair is now 37 years of age, is a man of temperate habits, and a good father. Walk on, walk on. <clears throat> I may add that his whole debts at the present moment, as far as we have been able to ascertain, amount to 88 pounds and 10 shillings, while he has 220 pounds sterling standing to his credit in the capital and county's bank. There is no reason, therefore, to think that money troubles have been weighing on his mind. Last Monday, Mr. Sinclair went into town rather earlier than usual, stating that he had two important commissions to perform and that he would bring his little boy a box of bricks home. Now, by the merest chance, his wife received a telegram on the same day to the effect that a small parcel of considerable value had arrived for her at the offices of the Aberdeen Shipping Company, sent to her by an uncle in Edinburgh. 
Now, if you are well up on your London, you will know that the office of this company is in Fresno Street, which branches out of Upper Swandham Lane, where you found it tonight. Mrs. Sinclair collected her packet and found herself at exactly 4.35, walking through Swandham Lane on her way back to the station. Have you followed me so far? Uh, it is very clear. Mm. If you remember, Monday was an exceedingly hot day, and Mrs. Sinclair walked slowly, glancing about in the hope of seeing a cab, as she did not like the neighbourhood in which she found herself. While she was walking in this way down Swandham Lane, she suddenly heard an ejaculation, or cry, and was struck cold to see her husband looking down at her. His face was terribly agitated. He waved his hands frantically to her, and then vanished from the window so suddenly that it seemed to her that he'd been plucked by some irresistible force from behind. One singular point which struck her quick feminine eye was that although he wore some dark coat, he had on neither collar nor necktie. She rushed up the steps of the building, which was none other than that which houses the opium den in its cellar where we met tonight. Let me in. My husband's in there. What have you done to him? What is all this noise? Man, there is no need for such commotion. My husband is in danger. I know he is. Let me pass. There is no one here. We are closed. No one is here. Let me in. I must see my husband. The bar of gold is not open. You cannot come in. I'll get a policeman. I'll, I'll get help. Oh, oh, thank God. Oh, Constable. Constable. Please, please wait. Constable! Oh, Constable! No, madam, it's all right. What seems to be the matter? It's my husband. He's in there, back there. They've taken him. What? Oh, come on, please. You must help. Very well. Lead the way, madam. Oh, the bar of gold. Right. We'll get him out if he's inside. Open up. I'm a police officer. Oh, well, what can I do for you, sir? I have reason to believe that you are detaining this good lady's husband. There is no one here, sir. You are most welcome to come and look. Right. So you're quite sure no one else has been in this room this afternoon? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, only myself and Hugh Boone. I see. And what about the cripple? He's not dumb as well, is he? Oh, no, sir. He can talk. But he has seen no one. Has anyone been up here, Boone? No, sir. No one but me and him. Right. Well, madam, I'm terribly sorry, I but... know he was here. I saw him. He's in the most terrible danger. I know it. Well, madam, perhaps you're a little overawed. It's been a hot day. Perhaps you only thought you saw him. I did see him. Would madam like a glass of water? It is such a hot day. Look! Oh. Look! Here. Look! These are the bricks my husband said he was going to buy for our children. He was here. Well, this puts a different complexion on the matter. What do you say now, Laska? Oh, sir, I, I have no idea. I I never saw them before in my life. Right, then. I'll search every inch of this place, then both of you can come down to the station. Steady, boy, steady. Damned and even here, Watson. Uh, hold on, there. The rooms were carefully examined, and the results all pointed to an abominable crime. The front room was plainly furnished as a sitting room and led into a small bedroom which looked out upon the back of one of the walls. Between the wharf and the bedroom window is a narrow strip of mud which is dry at low tide but is covered with water at high tide with at least four feet of water. And the bedroom window was a broad one and open from below. On examination, traces of blood were to be seen upon the window sill and several scattered drops were visible upon the wooden floor of the bedroom. Steady! Thrust away behind a curtain, in the front room were all the clothes of Mr. Neville Sinclair, with the exception of his coat, his boots, his socks, his hat, his watch, all were there. There were no signs of violence upon any of these garments, and there were no other traces of Mr. Neville Sinclair. Out of the window, he apparently must have gone, for no other exit could be discovered, and the ominous bloodstains upon the window sill gave little promise that he could save himself by swimming, for the tide was at its very highest at the moment of the tragedy. And now to the villains who seemed to be immediately implicated in the matter. Alaska was known to be a man of the vilest antecedents, but, as by Mrs. Sinclair's story, he was known to have been at the foot of the stair within a very few seconds of her husband's appearance at the upper window. He could hardly have been more accessory to the crime. His defence 
is one of absolute ignorance, and he protested that he had no knowledge as to the doings of Hugh Boone, his lodger, and that he could not account in any way for the presence of the missing gentleman's clothes. So much for the Lascar manager. Now for the sinister cripple who lives upon the second floor of this building, and who was certainly the last human being whose eyes rested upon Neville Sinclair. Oh. His name is Hugh Boone, and his hideous face is one which is familiar to every man who goes much into the city. He is a professional beggar, though in order to avoid the police regulations, he pretends to a small trade in wax vestas. Oh. Some little distance down Threadneedle Street, upon the left-hand side, there is, as you may have remarked, a small angle in the wall. Here it is that this creature takes his daily seat, cross-legged with his tiny stock of matches on his lap, and as he is a piteous spectacle, a small rain of charity descends into the greasy leather cap which lies on the pavement beside him. I have watched the fellow more than once before I ever thought of making his professional acquaintance, and I have been surprised at the harvest which he has reaped. His appearance, you see, is so remarkable that no one can pass him without observing him. A shock of orange hair, a pale face disfigured by a horrible scar, which by its contraction has turned up the outer edge of his upper lip. A bulldog chin and a pair of very penetrating dark eyes, which present a singular contrast to the colour of his hair. All this marks him out from amid the common crowd of mendicants. And so too does his wit, for he is ever ready with a reply to any piece of chaff which may be thrown at him by a passerby. This is our suspect. But a cripple? What could he have done single-handed against a man in the prime of life? He is a cripple in the sense that he walks with a limp. But in other respects, he appears to be a powerful and well-nurtured man. Mm. Surely your medical expertise would tell you, Watson, that weakness in one limb is often compensated for by exceptional strength in the others. Uh, well, pray continue your narrative. Mrs. Sinclair had fainted at the sight of the blood upon the window sill and she was escorted home in a cab, the policeman having called for some assistance for the lady. One mistake had been made in not arresting Boone instantly, as he was allowed some few minutes in which he might have communicated with his friend at Alaska. But this thought was soon remedied. The policeman returned and conducted a very thorough search. Right, what about this blood then, eh? Please, sir. I have no idea how it comes to me. It, it's my blood. I cut my finger. Look. I see. Well, what about these clothes then? Never seen them before. Alaska? No. I, I don't know how they... Ah, very convenient. And how do you suppose the lady saw her husband at the window? He must have been dreaming. Or Barney. I don't have to listen to you. You're off to the station. Come on. Get your hands off me. Please. Please. Please, sir. We got nothing. Come on, boy. Not far now. Despite his protestations, this creature was arrested and is now at the police station. The officer returned and continued his search. He hoped that the ebbing tide might afford some fresh clue, and it did, though they hardly found upon the mud what they feared to find. It was Neville Sinclair's coat, and not Neville Sinclair, which lay uncovered as the tide receded. And what do you think they found in his pockets? I cannot imagine. No, I didn't think you would guess. Every pocket stuffed with pennies and hypnies. 421 pennies and 270 hypnies. Good Lord. It was no wonder it had not been swept away by the tide. But a human body is a different matter. There is a fierce eddy between the wharf and the house. It seemed likely enough that the weighted coat had remained when the stripped body had been sucked away into the river. But I understood that all the other clothes were found in the room. Would the body be dressed in a coat alone? No, sir. But suppose that this man Boone had thrust Neville Sinclair through the window. There is no human eye which could have seen the deed. What would he do then? It would, of course, instantly strike him that he must get rid of the tell-tale garments. He would seize the coat and be mere for throwing it out when it would occur to him that it would swim and not sink. He has little time, for he has heard the scuffling downstairs. There is not an instant to be lost. He rushes to some secret hoard where he has accumulated the fruits of his beggary and stuffs all the coins upon which he can lay his hands into the pockets and only has time to close the window when the policeman appears. Oh, it certainly sounds feasible. Well, we will take it as a working hypothesis for want of a better one. But I must confess I cannot recall any case within my experience which looked at first glance so simple and yet presented such difficulties. Ah, we are almost there. Now we shall meet Mrs. Sinclair. I do hate to meet her, Watson, when I have no news of her husband. Here we are. Whoa there. Whoa! Ah, that must be Mrs. Sinclair. She must be in great distress. What a comely woman. Poor creature. 
I pray Holmes can shed some light on all this. Well, well, no good news. No. No bad? No. Oh, thank God for that. But come in. You must be weary, for you've had a long day. Thank you. This is my friend, Dr. Watson. He's been most vital to me in several of my cases, and I am fortunate he could accompany me tonight. I am delighted to see you. You will, I am sure, forgive anything that may be wanting in our arrangements when you consider the blow that has come so suddenly upon us. My dear madam, I am an old campaigner. No apology is needed. I am happy to be of service. Thank you. Now, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, I should very much like to ask you one or two plain questions to which I beg that you will give a plain answer. Certainly, madam. Do not trouble about my feelings. I am not hysterical, nor given to fainting. I simply wish to hear your real, real opinion. Upon what point? In your heart of hearts, do you think Neville is alive? Well, oh, I... Frankly, now. Frankly, then, madam, I do not. You think that he is dead? I do. Murdered? I don't say so. Perhaps. And on what day did he meet his death? On Monday. Then perhaps, Mr. Holmes, you will be good enough to explain how it is that I have received a letter from him today. What? Yes. Today. May I see it? Certainly. Of course, writing on the envelope. Surely this is not your husband's hand, madam? No, but the enclosure is. I perceive also that whoever addressed the envelope had to go and inquire as to the address. How can you tell that? The name you see is in perfectly black ink, which has dried itself. The rest is of the greyish colour, which shows that blotting paper has been used. If it had been written straight off and then blotted, none would have been of a deep black shade. This man has written the name, and there has been a pause before he wrote the address, which can only mean that he was not familiar with it. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Let us now see the letter. Hmm. There's been an enclosure here. Yes, there was a ring. His signet ring. Are you sure that this is your husband's hand? One of his hands. One? His hand, when he wrote hurriedly. It is very unlike his usual writing, and yet I know it well. Dearest, do not be frightened. All will be well. There is a huge error which it may take some time to rectify. Wait in patience, Neville. Written in pencil on the flyleaf of a book. Octavo size, no watermark. Hmm. Posted today in Gravesend by a man with a dirty thumb. Ah. And the flap has been gummed, if I'm not very much in error, by a person who had been chewing tobacco. And you have no doubt that this is your husband's hand, madam? None. Neville wrote those words. Well, Mrs. Sinclair, the clouds lighten, though I should not venture to say the danger is over. But he must be alive, Mr. Holmes. Unless this is a clever forgery to put us on the wrong scent. The ring, after all, proves nothing. It may have been taken from him. No, no, but it is his very own writing. Very well. It may, however, have been written on Monday and only posted today. That is possible. If so, much may have happened between. Oh, you must not discourage me, Mr. Holmes. I know that all is well with him. There is so keen a sympathy between us that I should know if evil came upon him. On the very day that I saw him last, he cut himself in the bedroom, and yet I, in the dining room, rushed upstairs instantly with the utmost certainty that something had happened. Do you think I would respond to such a trifle and yet be ignorant of his death? I have seen too much not to know that the impression of a woman may be more valuable than the conclusion of an analytical reasoner. But if your husband is alive and able to write letters, why should he remain from you? I cannot imagine. It is unthinkable. Mrs. Sinclair, cast your mind back. When you saw your husband, was the window open? Yes. Then he might have called to you? He might, but he only... Yes, gave an inarticulate cry. A call for help, as you thought. Yes. But it might have been a cry of surprise. Astonishment at seeing you. And you thought he was pulled back? He disappeared so suddenly. He might have leapt back. You did not see anyone else in the room? No, but the horrible beggar man confessed to having been there. And he was without his collar or tie? Yes, I distinctly saw his bare throat. 
Thank you, Mrs. Sinclair. Those are the principal points about which I wish to be absolutely clear. We shall now have a little supper and then retire, for we may have a busy day tomorrow. Right, Holmes. I'm going to get some sleep. I've got to get some rest before tomorrow. <coughs> Good night, my dear Watson. Hmm? Oh, I see. Holmes is in for a night thinking. Now, what's he doing now? Collecting all the pillows from his bed and all the cushions from the sofa and the armchairs. Now he's arranging them into some sort of eastern divan. Looks like a pasha sitting cross-legged in that great blue silk dressing gown of his. Ah, uh, and he's laid out an ounce of shag tobacco and a box of matches in front of him. He'll be there all night in a cloud of pipe smoke. All night long. Till he's... Awake, Watson? Yes. Game for a morning drive? Certainly. Then dress. No one is staring. What time is it? Twenty-five minutes past four? Oh, I'm not surprised no one's stirring. Come on, Watson. Ready yourself. Oh, nearly there, Holmes. I think, Watson, you are standing in the presence of one of the most absolute fools in Europe. I deserve to be kicked from here to Charing Cross, but I think I have the key to the affair now. And where is it? In the bathroom. Eh? Oh, yes. I'm not joking. I have just been there, and I have taken it out, and I have got it in this Gladstone bag. Come on, my boy, and we shall see whether it will not fit the lock. Now, come on. We must be at Bow Street Station before seven o'clock. It has been in some points a singular case. I confess I have been as blind as a mole, but it is better to learn wisdom late than never to learn it at all. Oh, uh, yes. I wish Holmes wasn't so mysterious, and I do wish he wouldn't go quite so fast. Who is on duty? Inspector Bradstreet, sir. Oh, there he is, sir. Ah, Bradstreet. How are you? Uh, I wish I have a quiet word with you, Bradstreet. Uh, certainly, Mr. Holmes. Uh, step into my room here. Okay. What can I do for you, Mr. Holmes? I've called about that beggar man, Boone. Oh, yeah. The one who was charged with being concerned at the disappearance of Mr. Neville St. Clair. Yeah, yeah, he was brought up and remanded for further inquiries. So I heard. You have him here? In the cells. Is he quiet? Oh, he gives no trouble. But he's a dirty scoundrel. Dirty? Yeah. It's all we can do to make him wash his hands. And his face is as black as a tinker's. Well, once his case has been settled, he'll have a regular prison bath. And I think if you saw him, you would agree with me that he needed it. I should like to see him. Very much. Will you? Oh, that's easily done. Come this way. You, you can leave your bag. No, I think that I'll take it. Oh, very good. Uh, come this way, if you please. Mm. The third on the right, it is. Now, here we are. Yeah, he's asleep. You can see him very well. He's a beauty, isn't he? He certainly needs a wash. I had an idea that he might, and I took the liberty of bringing the tools with me. Oh, a sponge, sir. Oh, you're a funny one. Now, if you will have the great goodness to open the door very quietly, we will soon make him cut a much more respectable figure. Well, I don't know why not. He doesn't look a credit to the Bow Street cells, does he? Let me introduce you to Mr. Neville St. Clair of Lee in the county of Kent. Only this horrid orange wig remains. Voila! Oh, good God, Holmes. Great heavens. It is indeed the missing man. Pale, refined-looking chap with black hair. I know him from the photograph. Be it so. And pray, what am I charged with? With making away with Mr. Neville. <laughs> oh, come, you can't be charged with that. Unless they make a case of attempted suicide of it. Well, I've been 27 years in the force, but this really takes the cake. If I am Mr. Neville St. Clair, then it is obvious that no crime has been committed and that therefore I am illegally detained. No crime, but a very great error has been committed. You would have done better to have trusted your wife. It wasn't the wife. It was the children. 
God help me, I wouldn't have them ashamed of their father. Oh my God, what an exposure. What can I do? If you leave it to a court of law to clear the matter up, of course, you can hardly avoid publicity. On the other hand, if you convince the police authorities that there is no possible case against you, I do not know that there is any reason that the details should find their way into the papers. Inspector Bradstreet would, I am sure, make notes upon anything which you might tell us and submit it to the proper authorities. God bless you. I would have endured imprisonment, I even execution, rather than have left my miserable secret as a family blot to my children. They need know nothing. But only if you tell your story now and swear never to resurrect Hugh Boone, the notorious beggar. Willingly. In brief, then, my story is this. I was a journalist. I was sent to write a story on begging in the metropolis. It was only by trying to beg that I could get the facts upon which to base my article. I was also once an actor and had learned all the secrets of makeup. I was famous in the green room for my skill. I painted my face, and to make myself look as pitiable as possible, I made a good scar. Then, with a red head of hair and an appropriate costume, I took my station in the busiest part of the city. For seven hours, I plied my trade. And when I returned home in the evening, I found to my surprise that I had received no less than 26 shillings and fourpence. I wrote my articles and thought little more of the matter until some time later I backed a bill for a friend and had a writ served on me for 25 pounds. I was at my wit's end where to get the money, but a sudden idea came to me. I begged a fortnight's grace from the creditor, asked for a holiday from my employers, and spent the time begging in the city under my disguise. In ten days, I had the money and paid the debt. Well, you can imagine how hard it was to settle down to arduous work at two pounds a week when I knew that I could earn as much in a day by smearing my face with a little paint, laying my cap on the ground and sitting still. It was a long fight between my pride and the money, but the dollars won at last, and I threw up reporting and sat day after day. <laughs> filling my pockets with coppers. It was a terrible secret I was never to share with my wife. When she saw me at the window, I thought all was lost. I just had time to apply my makeup and throw my coat weighted with coins into the river. In the course of hurriedly opening the window, I reopened a small cut which I'd inflicted upon myself in the bedroom that morning. I was quite relieved when the police arrived that I was arrested for the murder of Neville Sinclair and not revealed as the man himself. Well, sir, I think you've wasted quite enough of our time over the last week. If the police are to overlook all this, we must hear no more of Hugh Boone the beggar. I have sworn it by the most solemn oaths which a man can take. Well, in that case, I think that it is probable that no further steps may be taken. But if you are found again, then all must come out. I'm sure, Mr. Holmes, we are all very much indebted to you for having cleared the matter up. Mm. I wish I knew how you reach your results. I reached this one by sitting upon five pillows and consuming an ounce of shag. I think, Watson, that if we drive to Baker Street, we shall just be in time for breakfast. Oh, good.
Edward Petherbridge was Sherlock Holmes, with David Peart as Dr. John H. Watson. The story was adapted for radio by Tim Crook, with violin music performed by Robert Gibbs and Michiku Ueno. I'm Steve Zakar. Support for this program is provided by National Public Radio member stations and the NPR Arts and Performance Fund. This is NPR, National Public Radio.